All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Hemp Chat. I'm your host, Derek Cross, and today we are going to be talking about what's growing and going on around the country. And some of that is about um, seeds versus clones and why you want to grow with one or the other if you're just getting into the space. And we have a great guest with us today, Sam Burney from Colorado, will be joining us uh, in their company at Point Three Group. And I want to introduce him to the show, but if you guys are familiar with this space and just getting involved, you know, clones might be the way for you to go versus, uh, especially in your planting stages and timelines. And we're in the middle of June going into July. So, you know, clones give you that little jump start. There's a, there's a lot of benefit into clones and I'll let Sam elaborate a little bit more on that as we grow forward in this conversation. So uh, once again, welcome to the Hemp Chat, Sam, and I thank you for your time and education is always important here on, on the show. And uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're doing in this space and how long you've been in here. Cool. Yeah. Thank you, Derek. I uh, really appreciate you having me on and i um, excited to talk to some of the uh, people that tune into the Hemp Chat today. Uh, so my company, like Derek said, is Point Three Group. Uh, we've been in business in the hemp industry since January of 2019, and uh, like like Derek said, our primary focus is uh, producing hemp clones, and um, we do that out in our facilities in Eastern Colorado, uh, where we have about an acre of greenhouse space uh, outfitted for for clone production. Wow, an acre. That's quite a bit under one greenhouse. Um, did did that greenhouse get built all at one acre or was it bits and pieces as you went? How big of a project um, did you guys undertake to put that together? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so the main greenhouse where we do the majority of the propagation at is uh, a six bay gutter connected um, greenhouse so that is one 27,000 square foot structure uh, that was all created at once and um, then we added uh, hoop houses for extra space for uh, veggie mother plants and and kind of overflow of clones uh, once they become fully rooted we're able to take them out to the hoop house space um, which you know has we have heaters fans uh, wet wall everything you'll you'll have in the main greenhouse uh, for those clones, but they just get a little bit more direct sun and um, and can, you know, veg more in the hoop house space. But actually how we uh, we built our greenhouse, we we bought a, bought it used originally and um, hired, a, hired a crew ourselves and and me and my brother-in-law constructed it. So it was a uh, quite quite an experience, something we had never done and, uh, uh, you know, tur turned out to, to be really, really great learning experience and a lot of hard work. And now we have, um, you know, a lot to, a lot to look back at and, you know, be proud of knowing that we, we built what we get to work in. So it's pretty unique. Well, there's a lot going on with people in expanding their processes for processing. I've seen people like yourselves go from smaller setups to larger. One acre is impressive. And then we know that other people have expanded even further. You know, it's interesting to really go in and see a greenhouse with that size and the amount of space that you <laughs> consume with plant material. It's a sea of green when you walk in. It's beautiful. So yeah, absolutely is. can you tell us a little bit uh, uh, about clones and why people would want to go ahead and get clones in, um, get started with you guys and elaborate for me? Yeah. So um, the main benefit of clones, or I guess the key difference uh, between, you know, a clone and a seed or a seed lean is that a clone is a, vegetative cutting taken off of a mother plant um, and then rooted in a soil soil cube. So what I mean by that for people that aren't um, familiar with the cloning process, you have a, a hemp plant that's in vegetative growth um, and that, that's your mother. So you'll take a, 
two or three inch cutting off of that or hundreds of them and then uh, prepare that cutting by cl clipping up the bottom leaves and then sticking it into a, a you know, 10 20 tray where you would then then fully root the clone and the reason you'll do that rather than just pitting a seed in the tray germinating popping that seed letting it grow to a field ready state in which you have a seedling is that the clones are exact genetic replicas of the mother stock so the mother plants that we've sourced have underwent vigorous R&D to uh, not only develop proprietary strains, which was done by um, our genetics partner and, and supplier, but to be phenotype specific. So even the, the varieties that are not proprietary, uh, like cherry abacus, abacus, berry blossom, bayox that we carry, they are phenotype specific uh, mother stock, meaning that they have went through the process of singling out the highest performing phenotype within uh, a given seed stock. So when you, you plant seeds of um, whether it's hemp or another, uh, you know, vegetable, et cetera, they have, they might be of the same genotype, meaning, you know, you have bush tomatoes or cherry hemp or, you know, whatever it is, but within any given seed stock, you have genetic differences that are either advantageous or, or not. Um, so a big thing that's important for a hemp farmer is consistency. And that is what you get when you, when you go with a clone um, that somebody has taken the time to do the R&D and single out the highest performing phenotype. And that's consistency in terms of uh, cannabinoid content, which obviously a lot, most folks are growing for CBD and Having high CBD means um, on a consistent basis means a higher return on a consistent basis. And then of course, compliance. Um, if you have some, some seeds that, you know, finish out and are extremely compliant, that's great. But if you have a couple different phenotypes in there that are prone to go hotter, that's uh, not so great. Um, so that's, that's the main benefit on the cannabinoid side you get with the clones. The other benefit being uh, consistency at harvest. So, when you have variation in phenotypes, you could have variation in maturity. So that can make it very challenging for a farmer to know when to harvest, when to get their compliance testing done, or you might just have to bite the bullet and have, you know, X amount of plants that are fully mature and some of the mix that are not as mature. So when you harvest, you could end up with lower yield, you know, th things of that nature. Um, so, so with the clones, since they are of a consistent phenotype, they mature at a similar rate uh, or exactly the same rate. And it, it just really simplifies things at harvest, uh, give you an average, higher average cannabinoid content in terms of CBD, lower average in terms of THC uh, and, you know, other, tr the traits go on and on that you can identify like the cherry abacus, for example, some of the seeds that were in the original batch had a light purple phenotype and some did not. Now they've been able to identify just that light purple phenotype so that every plant in the field can be completely consistent, which, uh, you know, is, is great for markability and, and that goes on for smokable quality traits or biomass production. Holy cow. So that's a lot. So that's, that's great information. And, and when I think of the clones and um, farming, can you answer the, if somebody's going to get clones, how many generations of clones can you do before you would have any indicators? Uh, you said a, an exact replica of the mother. So, you know, what we do here on the hemp chat and we talk about risk mitigation and uh, that's part of it, right? So you can prove that same um, quality content through right and then if you go and clone that plant two or three times down the line does that stay pretty consistent do people have to worry about cloning and cloning and cloning yeah so um genetic drift is uh is what you're referring to and that's definitely an issue 
Um, and to mitigate that, uh, our genetics partner has uh, you know, tissue culture clones, which is a way that they can hold that original uh, phenotype selected mother stock. And then each year uh, we'll start our, our mother plants off of, uh, you know, tissue culture clones, uh, which, you know, really eliminate the risks that you're talking about. Because yes, if you, if you hold mother stock, you know, season after season and you have you know, clones that have, have been cloned off five, six, seven times, then you can start to get some genetic drift, if not uh, some, you know, disease or, or risk within, within the plants that, that can be, you know, multiplied by cloning them. Um, so, so we pretty much eliminate that by, by starting with clean, clean mothers from a tissue culture program. Okay. Well, thank you. That's really insightful. Um, the other question I have is uh, a lot of farmers will have some concerns um, that one concern that farmers have with clones is that they do not produce a tap root. Tap root. What's your opinion on this? Uh, yeah, so, so that's been a big, a big argument um, where, you know, basically the premise is, okay, seeds produce this taproot, which, which is valid and true. And the taproot, you know, digs, it basically is a single center root that digs deeper and um, grows thicker than the rest of the, uh, the roots in the plant. And for that reason, uh, a lot of folks claim that that makes a stronger root system to hold up the plant in high winds. But I think there's a few key advantages to uh, the strong lateral root systems that clones have. One of which being since the lateral roots spread out more, um, it creates a larger base for the plant. So imagine like you stick a single pole in the ground or you stick like a five prong pitchfork in the ground. You know, those multiple prongs might not be as deep, but they could, you know, hold up better because they are, uh, anchoring a larger area. Uh, so, so that's really my take and what I've seen from my experience on the size of the, the root ball holding up in a wind. Uh, and not only that, the, uh, the top several inches of roots is where most of the nutrient feeding occurs. So having a stronger root system on those top several inches uh, actually allows the plant to, to take in a lot more nutrients. So the tap root can dig deeper and find you know, water deep in the, deep in the ground. And that's excellent. But, you know, most people that are farming hemp have you know, proper irrigation, whether it's, you know, drip, flood, pivot, the plants are getting plenty of water. Um, it, if you, you know, are growing for cannabinoids and, and care about keeping your plants healthy, you probably have them on a good watering schedule. So the, you know, the benefit of, of having the the clone strong root system, I think kind of outweighs that of having a tap root. And, um, you know, I think a big reason why you've seen, uh, some farmers get a bad taste in their mouth from having clones that fall over in the field is because they source them from somebody that wasn't exactly producing a, a high quality clone, didn't have a great root system or even worse, it had been held in the tray too long and was very root bound. Uh, which which we've eliminated the root bounding problem as well because our trays um, are oversized and that allows for air pruning technology or air pruning of the roots. So basically as the roots grow too long, they naturally kind of uh, trim themselves back, if that makes sense. So you don't get that uh, that root bounding issue. Okay. Well, well that's, that's, that's really good information. Thank you. Um, you know, another thing is, is our, um, our listeners are spread all, all across the country. And I have a question as far as in the clone business, um, where can you ship these clones and how late in the season can someone plant a clone? What do you think about that? Yeah, so that's, that's a great, that's a great question. And, um, you know, with us being in Eastern Colorado, uh, we can, pretty much ship nationwide because just about anywhere in the country we could get a refrigerated truck with a two-man crew um, 
to bring a bring a load or shipment to in in about 24 hours. So, you know, the the clones are um, are you know healthy and happy when they arrive if we can get them there in you know under 30 hours, and uh, we're even able to uh, box them and palletize them, which the boxes help hold the humidity um, and keep keep the plants you know. Uh, healthy and, and, and safe. And, you know, people are concerned about major losses during shipment. And in, in our experience up, up to this point, we've had a really high success rate as far as shipping um, to East Coast, West Coast, uh, all over. And then as far as planting, I think that uh, we still have a couple good weeks, I would say until mid-July, um, you're still good to plant. And uh, it, it also depends heavily on the cultivar that you match with the region. Yes. So can you elaborate on that? Talking about the cultivars yeah. and the regions and what, what people can expect. Yes. That's the, really the first question we ask when a, when a client comes to us is, you know, what, what's the purpose of your grow smokable or, or biomass production, et cetera, which we have, you know, cultivars that, pair better for either of those but then the next mo most important thing is going to be what region they're growing in and the reason for that is that um you know ca um, cannabis or hemp is is triggered by the the light cycle it, it has a um, flower response time um, varying by cultivar and that's based on the photo period so for example the uh, abacus and cherry abacus, which a lot of folks might be familiar with those varieties, are very early finishers. They'd be ideal to ship up north, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, um, you know, et cetera, because they trigger into flower at when there's 15 hours or less of, sun, of daylight in, in any given day. And then these varieties only take about seven weeks to finish flower. So the reason that's so important for a uh, region up north is that they can finish off before any risk of frost. Similarly, the double Dutch variety that we carry is a very late bloomer. It, it doesn't start flowering until there's less than 13 hours of daylight. And then after that, it takes nine weeks to finish. So if you were to ship that variety up north, then it might never get to 13 hours or less of daylight and they would just grow, the plant would just grow 20 feet tall and produce little tiny buds, if any. On the other hand, if you ship it down south to Arkansas, Louisiana, Florida, Texas, Southern California, then it's going to trigger at a good time in its life cycle. It's going to take that full nine weeks to finish. That they'll grow you know, absolutely massive, but they'll also produce you know, nice big buds because they uh, have that, that light cycle. And, you know, same goes for uh, the middle of the country. We have varieties that, that basically will perform well from north to south, everywhere in between. And then we have some varieties that are specific for the northern states or the southern states. And that's just a really important consideration um, when you're looking at mitigating your risk of frost and, you know, taking advantage of... Uh, the most vegetative growth and best flowering time that you can. All right. Wow. Yeah, that's great information, Sam. Thank you very much for that. Uh, it's very important, guys, when you're out there learning the importance of, um, there's so much that goes into this. Everybody thinks that growing hemp or cannabis is just so easy, and it technically is. It's it's not a lot of science, but when you're really growing for genetics and you're really growing for value, uh, it, it does make a difference. And getting products, uh, whether you're into seed or clones or both, um, it's getting the right information to make you successful. It's getting the right materials to make you successful. And when you're doing large scale grows, you you take every bit of it into your business decisions. And at the end of the day, it, it's all about getting the higher yields, getting the better benefit and the high quality product to bring to market. Right. And so um, when, when we are here on 
the hemp chat, our mission is planting seeds of wellness for the people on the planet, but we can also plant the clones for wellness for the people on the planet as well, right? <laughs> yeah, hey, they all uh, they all started from a seed originally, just yeah. sourced out the the top top seed and, that's, and that's planted right. that for the the betterment of of the wellness. That's right, and so you know, um, you get a little head start with the clone versus the seed and, and you get more, what am I trying to say here? You're getting, you're getting the head start that's needed. And right now, like Sam said, uh, you can, you could get these clones shipped and get, get them into the soil. Uh, what does, what does a client expect? I mean, is there a pretty good developed root system on these clones when they get them? And when you get them, what, uh, what am I trying to say? Uh, what, what would a client expect when they receive a clone from you? That's what I'm asking. Yeah. So kind of like, uh, what you were getting at is the head start is, you know, you, it's, it's too late to pop a seed if you want to have a, uh, you know, any time for, for vegetative growth. So to get a, a seed to, um, the same state as the clone, you would have had to, you know, pop that, germinate that seed about six weeks, seven weeks ago. Um, so that is giving you a major uh, head start on growth uh, of the plant. And um, when, when you receive a clone from, from us, it will be, you know, six to 10 inches tall on its third leaf set plus uh, fully rooted. And like I said, it, the roots naturally air prune. Um, so, you know, you can, and, and harden it off. So that means we, you know, expose it to the elements a little bit and get it to a state where when it gets out of the field, it's not going to, uh, get beat up by the sun, beat up by the wind because it's already experienced a little bit of that. Um, so it's, it, it's a, going to be a, a fully established plant and already have underwent some vegetative growth, started pushing some leaf sets out, which will turn into your main branches. Um, and we can also uh, top the clones before shipping them out uh, by request. That's kind of a uh, split camp on, on whether you should do that as well. Uh, some people say that, you know, I mean, obviously topping them just means for those of you that don't have cutting the, um, the main stock. And then the, the plant has more, uh, more branch growth. It, it, focuses energy on expanding out, becoming bushier. But some people say that later in the flower in the field, they've seen the plants split uh, due to having, you know, heavier colas on, on longer branches, but uh, kind of that's up for debate. But Right. So in transport, have you guys seen any issues uh, transporting your products from state to state? And, and also, what type of paperwork is in order or needed for you to transport these products from uh, B to B, right? Okay, yeah. So you mean more from a, uh, a legal perspective than a Correct. plant loss perspective? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So we include a uh, you know, phytosanitary certificate. Um, which is something that we, you know, get through the Colorado Department of Ag. Basically, they come out to our facility before we uh, send a shipment out, and they check the clones and mother stock for uh, pests and, and disease, and you know, check off. Okay, these are healthy. You know, no, um, no pests that you know we see on our end. And then we require, um, you know, a hemp license for the uh, registered grower uh, from whatever given state, and um, we ha we work with some freight providers that are s both specific and not specific to hemp and cannabis, but um, you know they they navigate uh, around the states that are at risk of um, you know hassling them. But really, it's becoming more and more of a non-issue, especially with these being young plants and in a vegetative state. So um, you know, any hemp plant can potentially go over the 0.3 threshold in flower. Uh, some of ours are very high CBD to THC ratios. So it's lesser of a chance, but regardless when they're just a little baby clone, um, you know, they have you no know, THC content or CBD content. 
Um, so, so that's really becoming more of a non-issue. And, and there are certain states that we have to navigate uh, certain regulations, like California has a strict uh, Japanese beetle quarantine. Uh, so, you know, our facility is beetle tight, if you will, which uh, allows us to navigate around that regulation. And it's kind of, it's different for every state, but, but really right now we can pretty much, uh, pretty much ship nationwide with no problems. And just need the buyer's registration, our registration, FIDA sanitary and a compliant, you know, COA that matches with the, uh, with the plants and we're good. So when somebody places a, an order with you, what kind of minimum um, MOQ do you have? Uh, what do you, what do you, the other thing is, is can somebody also run a, a trial on these genetics for a season or tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So uh, our minimum order quantity is one is a thousand plants. Um, but you can mix and match between the varieties that we carry, uh, which is, which is eight that we have available um, right now. And uh, so with that being said, you know, I'm going to recommend certain ones based on the region. So, I mean, there's just some that I'm not going to ship up north, not going to ship down south. But anyways, if you wanted to, uh, if you, somebody wanted to get in contact with me, I could recommend, you know, the four top performing varieties that uh, will do well in their region. And they could trial, they can make up their minimum order quantity between multiple plants so they can you know, trial and get a feel for several of the different varieties that we have. Uh, if they're, you know, interested in placing a larger order next year or uh, want to see how they stack up against some of the other genetics that they've sourced. Hmm. Okay. And then when you're, when we're talking earlier in the episode, we we're talking about your, about an acre or so um, greenhouse. Are you, do you have any outdoor or are these clones going to be better performers indoor or outdoor? What are your recommendations on, on that? Um, so, so both. Um, I mean, there are some varieties, uh, like Dutch Delight, for example, is a great variety for smokable flour. It's also a heavy yielder and good biomass producer. Uh, one of our most compliant um, varieties hit in a 35 to 1 ratio of total CBD to total THC. So for your listeners that aren't familiar with the CBD to THC ratios, that basically means if, if it's at a 0.3 total THC, multiply that by 35, given the 35 to 1 ratio, and, and it'll be sitting on average at about a 10.8, 11% uh, CBD um, at, at a compliant, total THC compliant state. Um, so like Dutch Delight would uh, really do great in um, indoor greenhouse environment for smokable, also do great outdoors for smokable. And um, we've you know also grown that and had, had clients grow that as a, as a really good biomass producer and having those high uh, CBD to THC numbers are benefit for biomass production as well. Then on the other hand, uh, Dutch Domination, Double the Cherries, Bayox, um, some of these varieties are really more prone to just packing on the pounds, if you will. So those are, are the varieties I'm going to recommend for somebody who tells me, hey, I'm just strictly growing for, uh, you know, weight for extraction material. I'd, I'd recommend those. If they want more of a multi-use crop, uh, the Dutch Delight or the Double Dutch would be their best bet. Um, if they're up north or they're growing for smokable abacus, cherry abacus, um, you know, so it kind of depends, but, um, so yeah, to answer your question, all of them will perform well outside. I think honestly, cannabis hemp in general just loves being outside and soaking in that sun and, um, some, and they'll all perform well indoors, but some of them are that don't have those smokable qualities. I wouldn't, you know, recommend for indoors because it's just, uh, yeah. yeah, not not worth growing indoors or greenhouse. Right, and and so um, you know, listeners, I, I want want you guys to really consider the clone approach right now and this time of season. And you know, we talk about risk mitigation. Obviously, when you're getting clones, you can buy feminized seed, but sometimes that's not always a guarantee. When you're getting clones, you know, tried and true in your crop, you're not going to have any males pop up on you. Um, for the most part. 
very, very rarely versus getting seed and getting a source like um, these clones from Point Three Group and Sam. They've done this for a long time now. They really work with the specialists in the field to get these clones right for you and your organization and for you to be profitable. And this is part of it. When you look at your input costs, farmers, you're looking at, I've seen seed prices from 50 cents. I've seen seed prices all the way up to, you know, a, a buck and a half, $2, $3 a seed, depending on varietals, right? When we're dealing with a clone, like what we have here and what Sam's offering, they actually have some good specials right now too. Uh, they've got about a million and a half clones. We'll, we'll, we'll ask Sam about that. But what I'm getting at is you get a clone that you come comes to you, you know, most of your clones are what, six to eight inches tall when, yeah. when people receive them. And when you're buying a clone that, that size, you got that big jump start, and you also have the security knowing that you're probably not going to have any males in your crop. You're not going to have these going to seed. You're going to have a great quality product. Um, at the end of the day. And that's what people are really after. And so the price, the, can you tell us about the price right now? Because the price is actually a real reasonable price. And, and for farmers getting input costs and trying to figure how much is this, you know, how much is this going to cost me? And, and, you know, if you get seeds, you got to germinate them. So you're losing time. You, you don't know how many are going to pop meaning how many are actually going to germinate and what percentage is that? And then you have to bring them. These are more hardy to plant. And it's really cool. The process of how you get the clones for new, new, new people in this space, you get the clones and they drop right into the ground and it's pretty easy. You make it easy. Yeah. With a, with a row planter, um, especially you can get that uh, consistency in the soil compaction um, and, and give those plants a really high, uh, chance of, of doing well. But yeah, so generally our prices um, are between $1.50 and 250 based on quantity. But right now until the end of the season, we're slashing prices down to 99 cents because like you said, Derek, between our facility and our partner facility, uh, which uh, is, um, you know, all of the same genetic varieties and phenotypes, etc. Uh, we have around a million and a half plants to move. And uh, you know, we want to we want to get these in the hands of farmers, show them uh, how viable they are, what kind of quality plants uh, we're producing, and how the genetics perform for them. And uh, you know, to do so, we're we're cutting prices down to 99 cents, and um, yeah, trying to clear out the rest of the inventory. And we uh, we've seen you know this year more so than than the last couple for a young plant provider has been a bit of a struggle as it has been across the entire industry. And uh, myself, I'm a strong believer in the hemp industry, in the plant, in cannabinoids. I see uh, the demand for CBD and hemp-derived products going up. And, um, you know, the amount of, amount of growers and producers uh, stagnating, if not, if not dropping significantly. So, you know, with that being said, I, I do see a large opportunity for those farmers and growers that can uh, properly cultivate this plant, be reasonable with their projections and take advantage of, um, you know, low input costs like the 99 cent uh, clone special that we're offering. That That is huge because 99 cents is, is really extremely reasonable. And, you know, all I can say to that is in comparison, if you go to, if you guys go to, a Home Depot or Lowe's or one of these Callaway garden centers, you go out and pick your little uh, plant that you're going to bring home and it costs more than that. You know, when you put it in the mindset, you're going to grow tomatoes and you're going to go pick them out from there. You're going to pay like three twenty nine dollars for a six inch plant, you know? So this is a great value. And then, you know, if you're going to buy larger quantities, you get a good product, they get boxed, they get shipped, they get them all sent to you. Obviously, uh, you get the experience and knowledge of these plants. And, uh, you know, I, I want to say thank you very much for what you guys are doing in the space. And if you guys get to ever see a greenhouse like that, I would, I would definitely recommend that you uh, contact um, Sam and their organization and, uh, you know, take a peek if they let you, you know. 
yeah, no, anyone's more than welcome to, uh, to come tour the facilities. We, uh, we welcome and, and appreciate that love uh, educating people and, you know, showing them what we do because, um, you know, a lot, a lot of people think like, Oh, you know, why would I, why would I buy a, a lot of hemp farmers are trying to bring everything in house. And we think it's important for, uh, you know, everyone to, I mean, in other industries, uh, a lot of, different sectors make up make up the greater whole you know and the reason that that we exist is we provide high quality fully rooted starts so that the farmer doesn't have to um you know it's just one more thing that uh, a a grower can take off their plate when it comes to you know properly prepping their fields uh hiring their temp staff for the season doing, uh, getting their amendments, their drip tape, you know, whatever their irrigation is, all of these things that go into it, they don't need to be worrying about, um, you know, greenhouse production and uh, propagation, holding mother stock, uh, popping seeds, which, like I mentioned, in my opinion, would be inferior because the uh, great genetic variation in the, the seed stock. But anyways, that, that's why we exist. And we love uh, having people out to our facility so we can show them that in person. Hey, look at the um, you know, SOPs, um, expertise, we're, we're trying to be, be masters in this space so that it's one less thing that, you know, the, the farmer grower has to become a master. At. And, and when you're, you know, when somebody reaches out to you guys at your group and, or, and contacts you directly, do you guys offer services as far as consulting and obviously you got these clones, but if I just call you, Hey, Sam, uh, I was, you know, heard you on the hemp chat. I want to, I want to get your clones. I don't know anything about this space, but I sure would like to get my fingers dirty and get the green thumb. What do you offer? Do you offer services? And also second part, do you help farmers sell their crops? Yeah. So, um, we uh, we don't exactly offer consulting services, but we definitely offer you know all the advice we can, um, and you know we are a resource for for the grower throughout the season. I mean our our phones you know always uh, always available um, <laughs> for any uh, issue that they might run into or just any advice that they might have. Um, I'll be the first to tell you I know what I know, but I'm not necessarily the uh, the expert in cultivation, but that's that's what my growers and my, my head grower and the rest of our team is there for. Um, and any question I can't answer, they surely can. And then as far as uh, market marketability and you know monetizing the crop, um, I uh, am networked with a lot of uh, buyers wholesale for smokable flour as well as labs that will do any combination of split agreements, tolling, uh, spot, spot buying, et cetera. And then another relationship that we have really developed heavily over the last few months is with a strategic partner out here in Colorado that for qualifying acreage, which would be 50 acres plus, um, preferably even more. And, you know, local to Colorado, uh, for the right acreage and the right partner, they'll travel as far as Kentucky, um, you know, around the country. But anyways, this group will, uh, come and harvest dry mill or pelletize the crop and then finance the processing into oil and then sell the oil and cut the farmer in on a revenue share, share uh, deal. So this is something that we're very excited about because it's opened up a lot of doors for us to help farmers, um, you know, uh, navigate the space more as an uh, agricultural commodity and, you know, kind of have this co-op model where we're able to provide the clone for a very cost effective price if they're buying them at scale. Then they do what they do as a farmer, uh, you know, plant, cultivate or cultivate in between the rows. Uh, water, tend to the plant, baby it until it's nice, nice and happy and healthy, mature, then have another team come through and handle everything from harvest to cash flow, cut the, cut the grower in on a uh, reasonable revenue share where they have a you know, clear path and expectation of uh, when they're getting paid, which is honestly um, something that, you know, I, I feel like this industry has, has been 
lacking up until this point. And we're seeing more and more um, groups come online like this as the market matures. And I, and I think that, you know, for biomass production and, and oil um, isolate, this is, this is really where, uh, where things are going overall. Yeah, you know, we've seen, uh, we've seen a lot going and growing on in this space. Um, and being able to have services that are out there that will work with farmers to, um, you know, help them get their crops to market. That's, that's a big thing. I, I know um, in, in some of my past shows, I've talked about, there's a lot of people that call me on a regular basis and a lot of people go into this without a plan. And then they call me and they're like, Hey, can you help me sell my crop? And I'm like, I don't, first off, don't know what you have. Don't know who you are. Don't know how you grew it. And um, I'm sorry, but you know, I can't help you. And I don't like to turn people away. I want to help people because that's what this is all about. Inspiring people to do it. But I also want people to grow slow. If you have no experience in this and you know, working with Sam and having a smaller MOQ, uh, of a thousand that gets you started because you know, on an acre most people are planting anywhere between what uh 12 to 2000 usually per acre is that what you're seeing with your clients um yeah so well it depends on on cultivar of course but uh i'd, I'd say that most of our cultivars will do best at like a four foot by four foot spacing which mm -hmm. that ends up at about 2,700, 2,700 plants per acre. Okay. Um, some can be planted, the cherry abacus and abacus can be planted far uh, denser at uh, about 5,000 an acre. Um, and other ones like the, the double Dutch could, could spread out more. Or if, if you got in early with the Dutch domination or double the cherries, you, you could do you know, a little bit wider spacing, maybe five by five. But um, I mean, at, at this point in the season, I would say planting planting dense is, is the is the best bet, um, just because um, you know not not that it's getting too late to plant by any means. I mean, I think that we're we're good to keep putting plants in the ground until around July fifteenth. Um, but you know, planting a little bit denser, you're going to maximize your acreage uh, and really use you know the same. Uh, inputs as far as amendments and water, um, but you know, get a get a more bountiful harvest per acre if that's how you're looking at it, uh, which most people are. I know, and I know it's easy to look at it per plant when you have an upfront cost per plant, but really the best way to measure things is uh, is per acre and what your right. your canopy is producing. Exactly, and and so you know when we're planting these um, and you get into higher uh, yields. What, what is, I, I, excuse me, I, I messed that up. My question was, you have a bunch of different varieties to offer and depending on the density, the yield performance is always different, but what does somebody expect on some varietals? Are they expecting quarter pound, half pound, two pounds? What, what are, what are they looking at as far as yield per plant roughly? I'm, I know it all varies, so I'm not going to hold you to it, but yeah, no, th that's a great question, and honestly, a question I get asked quite often. Um, but I, from clients, but I try, I try not to speak to it too much because, like you said, I don't want to be held to anything because there is so many factors um, that are out of my control once the clone gets in the grower's possession, right? right? I mean, how they feed it, how they water it, etc. But just on a, on a high level, I would say that. Uh, you know, the big, uh, big yielders as far as biomass um, production, uh, like Dutch domination, double the cherries, could be, you know, two, two and a half pounds per plant. Um, if you get them in the ground soon, uh, those are really heavy yielders as far as biomass. And then, you know, the other varieties, I'd say, I'd say a safe mark is a pound per plant plus. You should be able to achieve that if you even if you aren't experienced, but you have good advice and you're learning from people like yourself, Derek, or you're asking, you know, you're really digging into your resources. You, you, you know, have some level of, of grow experience with other crops and you should be able to get the plant if you're running the projections 
on, hey, how much am I going to, what kind of ROI am I going to see on this clone? Um, you know, I would say go on the conservative side. And, um, and it also depends on what your purpose is, you know, like you could harvest a, you could project, say, okay, I'm going to harvest a half pound per plant of smokable flour and then have another pound of biomass after take, go through and take those smokable tops. I'm going to estimate third of a pound to a half pound, and then I'm going to estimate a pound of biomass. I think that would be a reasonable, reasonable expectation. But, um, you know, like I said, some plants pack on the pounds more than others. And, uh, you know, I'm glad to, to help run through some of those, uh, those numbers and projections with folks. I just try not to, uh, no, uh, yeah. And I, I, I'm not trying to, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm tr not putting you on the spot and everybody has to have an open mind that there are yeah. so many factors. And that's kind of what I was saying. It's not that easy to just grow. It is, but when you take all, yeah every bit of this, how much is my yield? You know, there's so much that goes into growing a successful crop. Yeah, I'm not going to hold you to that. I do urge you people to reach out to your local agronomist, do your soil sampling, look at what your fertilizations are going to be reaching out. Like uh, Sam said to your networks, get, get, you know, call up your buddy, your grower, uh, you know, learn from others. And, you know, the expectations are only as good as what you do with your crop at the end of, the, you know, yep. the whole process. And, and it is a very, you know, hardy plant. And in some states, you know, you'll see it growing on the side of the road, just, you know, feral hemp and volunteer plants. Um, so, you know, it, it has a, it has the will to grow. It has the sun, the water, et cetera. It will grow. But that doesn't mean that it's um, going to be a marketable and desirable end product. Uh, without, you know, the proper care and know-how. Um, and honestly, um, how, you know, I think that you get a head start on that to having a marketable crop is having top quality genetics and um, consistency throughout. And that that's really, you know, where we come in and, and try to kickstart uh, a farmer season with having a field-ready plant that's going to take root and take off, um, having the top quality genetics, and then uh, having some, you know, expert support and, and guidance throughout the, the season as well. Yeah, you always need that extra support and guidance for sure. And, you know, if you guys need uh, a helping hand, you can reach out to us here at the Hemp Chat with our resources. You can reach out to Sam at, you know, Point Three Group and um, – he can help hook you up with some resources there as well with their teams that they have in place, their partners and so on. So I re recommend you guys do that. I recommend you guys right now get there and, you know, 99 cents is real reasonable for these. It, it's an opportunity to get experience right now with less risk. And when you could place an order, get them shipped in a relatively short amount of time and receive them. And, and just when you receive them, you open them and go, Oh, my babies are here. My babies are here. And then you get to put them in the soil. That's so refreshing. So rewarding. It's a, it's a feeling like no other, honestly. I mean, it's one thing um, that you guys are doing this great work, but how do people enjoy this with us? You know, how do they contact you? Where do they get your information and and so on because i want these people to start buying these today <laughs> not tomorrow it's, uh, it's not next week get, get them in the, get, get, them get your ground. orders now uh, that's right they're they're loving the uh this the soil medium and the root ball that they have but they're itching for some uh some bigger bigger and better dirt to spread their uh roots out right uh yes yeah, so we're, you can visit us on point three group.com it's p-o-i-n-t number three group um I'm sure Derek can uh, link it in the in the bio as well as we're really active on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, and you you feel free to contact me direct. I'll give Derek my uh, contact info. You shoot me an email, phone call, text. Uh, it's just uh, tis the season, you know. We're we're wide open to just shipping out plants and and helping farmers figure out what uh, you know cultivar is going to be best for them and their their environment. 
That's right. Well, thanks, Sam. I greatly appreciate your experience and knowledge, educating as always, as we do here on the Hemp Chat. Appreciate your time for the show. And for all you buyers out there, mention that you heard it on the Hemp Chat. And uh, that way Sam knows where the lead came from. And maybe I get a little something in return. I don't know, maybe a couple, uh, couple of clones for myself. I don't know. <laughs> but I urge you all to go and check them out and uh, give Sam a call. You give them some business over there and you know, you're dealing with professionals in the space and that's one of the most important things. Know who you're dealing with and getting the right product for you guys to be successful in the space is so huge. It's so huge. So thank you, Sam, very much in the point three group for all your hard work and efforts. I greatly appreciate your time on the hemp chat. Yep. Likewise. Thank you, Derek, and uh, the Hemp Chat and um, all, of, all of what you do for the industry and the hemp community. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And I uh, appreciate you too. So you guys get out there and get planting, okay? Hey guys, that's it for our show here today. Thank you very much again for being a part of what we're doing here on the Hemp Chat. Education, inspiration, and and just getting the seeds of wellness out to the people on the planet. And that's what we're here to do and provide you with the best information out um, to keep this industry um, growing. And uh, I mean it in a good way. And it's guys like Sam and um, their company, Point Three Group, that really help provide value in this uh, chain of information, knowledge, plants, and... Uh, like I said in the episode, we're, we're planting seeds of wellness for the people on the planet. And we thank you for joining us every week and uh, uh, learning more about what this amazing plant can do for you and how it can impact your community. And remember to love one another, embrace one another, as I always say, in hemp we trust. And I trust in you guys and I believe you guys are gonna get the right information from here. And I hope you guys appreciate the show. Go over to www.thehempchat.com. Subscribe on our YouTube channel and go over to our website. Uh, contact us there for more information. We've got some great things coming. I'm involved with some really cool stuff that I can't wait to share on the Hemp Chat with you guys in a real future, real short future episode coming. All I can say it's really, really amazing. And I'm so thankful and blessed. And I appreciate you guys, all the listeners around the globe. Thank you once again for being a part of the Hemp Chat and making us one of the top hemp media outlets 